Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is, when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today, to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people, because the word is gonna come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasten your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Next verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If you have been following the discourse from when we began this series, you will understand why Bible scholars and theologians have conclusively agreed that the epistles explains the Old Testament. The epistles explains the Old Testament. I think by now it's clear in your mind from the things we've been doing in, you know, over the years as we keep learning. 
The word expound there is the Greek word diamenua, which means he went from scripture to scripture. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Now, it's important for you to see like brother Paul would say to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture profitable for explanation or teaching. The word, the word their doctrine explanation or teaching remember one of the things we said earlier is that jesus's response here had to do with a prior conversation his response here where he said to them oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken had to do with a previous discussion they were having before they arrived at this point and that conversation we can locate it very clearly in luke chapter 24 they were having a discussion about the event and he said to them from the scriptures that it is already written. It's not a new thing. It's not a new development. That Christ will suffer these things and enter into his glory. He took their experiences and said to them, those experiences they were having were already prophesied. So you don't have to be in Jerusalem to believe the experiences of the past three days. Because everything that happened from his crucifixion to his death and his burial were already contained in the Old Testament books as prophecies. So there was nothing that really happened in the experiences that was new. You didn't even have to be in Jerusalem to know. Just read the Old Testament. You'll be able to put together all of those experiences from the written world. So they were already spoken ahead of him. We said in the last session that the crown of that discourse in Luke chapter 24 verse 25 to 27 was the resurrection of Jesus. Now let's proceed from there. So Jesus took their experiences and his witnesses and explained to them without their experiences. He took their experiences and his witnesses and explained to them without their experiences from the scriptures. He used the scriptures to explain itself. Look at Luke chapter 24 from verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went and he made as though he would have gone further. Next verse. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Next verse. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them. Now, please listen carefully. People assume that what they did there was communion. That's an assumption, because what actually happened here was not communion at all. They will have said that the account of John chapter 6 was communion. You know, the account of John chapter 6 where Jesus took bread and broke it and blessed it and gave them to feed 5,000 people. They will have said that was Holy Communion because the assumption is everywhere you see he took bread and broke it, it must be communion. But that's not true. That was not a communion service. What was happening there was simply, you know, he took bread like we have dinner and I just take food and I bless the food and, and give everybody to eat. That's exactly what happened there. Now, Look at that verse 30 of Luke 24. Please pay attention. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them. 31. Pay attention. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Their eyes were opened. The word open there is the word dinego, which means the first time they saw Jesus. So their eyes were opened to see him. What he was doing all the while was opening the scriptures for them to see him in the scriptures. So, two things happened. Their eyes opened to the scriptures and their eyes opened to him. Two things. The question, which one first opened? Huh? To the scriptures. Alright? So that is the first one that opened first. Then follow through with their experience of knowing him. They follow through their experience of receiving him from the scriptures. So one led to the other. They saw him in the scriptures and knew him by experience. So two things open. Firstly, their minds were opened. Then their eyes were opened. Their minds, which is the scripture were opened, then their eyes, which was experience, was opened. 
Look at what they said in verse 32 of Luke chapter 24. And they said one to another. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Did not our hearts burn? That is inside of them. The word burn is the Greek word kaio, K-I-A-O. Same word used for John. A burning and a shining light. The same word. And that word is used for zeal and eagerness. That is, as he opened the scriptures to them, they wanted to hear more. And that is how true insight into God's word is. One will create a thirst. As you begin to hear the word of God, and the word of God begins to open up to you, the true proof that you are growing in the knowledge of Christ is suddenly there is an unquenchable hunger to learn. There is an unquenchable desire to learn and to grow. When you arrive at a place where you have now arrived, you are not growing and you are not learning anything. The true proof of growth is that the more you learn, the more you want to learn some more. So there's a thirst and there's a desire and appetite created in you for more of God's word. Luke chapter 24 verse 32. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, as he did that, the scriptures came alive and their understanding was open. As he began to teach them from the scriptures, their understanding were open because the scriptures came alive. Now, look at verse 33 and 34. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. And them that were with them. Now look at 34. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed and had appeared to Simon. Next verse. And they told one things were done in the way and now he was known of them in breaking of bread. 36. And as they thus speak, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Second appearance. The first appearance was when he taught them in Luke 24, 25, 26, 27. And then their hearts burned. They knew him. He vanished. Then as they were discussing, he appeared again in their midst. That's the second time. What was astonishing to them was the fact that the scriptures could locate their experiences. That they could see that what they had experienced was already written in the scriptures. So they went to tell folks they have seen Jesus. Now so from verse 35, the breaking of bread again, there was not communion. It was to share bread. You know, like you share bread with people. That's why when Paul was going to explain the unity of the body of Christ, he used the breaking of bread to show that we are the bread and the body of Christ. We are that bread. And when he was making that illustration in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he was not endorsing communion. He was just explaining the unity of the body of Christ. Basically, what Brother Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 was the fact that we are one bread and we are one body. That's all he was talking. And how that if this body does not function well, the enemy can come in and take advantage. And through the coming in of the enemy because of our sensitive, our lack of discerning the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Our lack of discerning one another because we do not discern the body. For this cause, some are sick. For lack of discernment, we create room for the devil to come in. When a sister begins to gossip a sister and a brother begins to betray another brother, what are you doing? You're creating a division in the body and that crack leaves a room for the devil to come in. That's what brother Paul was teaching. He was not talking about eating physical elements. He was actually dealing with the fact that in the body of Christ, we are one body. And if we do not discern our oneness and our unity in Christ Jesus, we can out of carelessness create room for the devil to come in. And for this cause, some are sick, some are weak, and some even die because they do not discern the lost body. Not because they do not eat elements. Because they do not discern the lost body. So what brother Paul was dealing with there is the unity of the body and I've exhaustively taught that in Soteria and in understanding the book of Ephesians. So you can get the materials, they will help you a lot. And because many people do not understand that what brother Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians, even great pastors, they have started teaching all kinds of things like healing and expectations and how to get breakthrough from eating elements and drinking elements. And it's because they do not follow the context, the pretext and the text of that 
particular scriptures. But basically, Brother Paul was just teaching about the unity and the healthy functionality of the body of Christ. So they saw Jesus that he had risen from the dead. Look at Luke 24 verse number 37. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. The question which was with them is this. Is he real or is he a ghost? Because he was appearing and disappearing. And as far as they are concerned, human beings don't appear or disappear. Only ghosts could appear and disappear. So they were wondering, this Jesus that has come back this time around, he is able to appear and disappear and reappear. Are we dealing with a ghost or are we dealing with a person? If you're in their shoes, you will think the same way, right? Yeah, I will think the same way. Now, so, verse 38. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit have not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Next verse. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Next verse. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? While they were still wondering, he saw the wonderment, if there's English like that, in their faces and in their eyes. He knew that they have not yet accepted that he was a physical person. They were still thinking he was a ghost, even though they were trying to believe him. So he now said to them, while they wondered, Have you here any meat that is so that you know that I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat natural food. Ghosts don't eat material stuff. All right. Have you any meat? And look at the smartness of this gentleman. Next verse, verse 42. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. They gave him real food, not snacks. They gave him real food to eat something that would require proper digestion. They gave him to eat to see that this man is a real human being because only real human beings digest food. All right, now, they gave him food to eat. Look at the next verse. And he took it and did eat before them. Next verse. Observe 44. And he said unto them, he just finished eating. Then he stood up and said, these are the words. <laughs> I love Jesus. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. Which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, so now there were two different sermons in one verse. The first sermon was 25 to 27, Luke 24. The second sermon is Luke 24, 44. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Now, when he said that, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, what was he referring to? Was he referring to incarnation or resurrection? Huh? Resurrection. These are the words I spoke to you while I was here with you. So you will have wondered that there are two Bible seminars held in one chapter. Jesus did two Bible conferences. One in verse 25 to 27 and then there is this one in verse 44. Now, you will think that revelation will emerge from these two seminars. 25 to 27 44, 45, 46. But no. Revelation knowledge did not emerge. Because they were still around John chapter 16 verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. They were still within the confines of that statement. So, he was explaining the things he said to them. He was just explaining that these are the things I was telling you about that I will die, I will suffer, and glory will follow. These are those things I told you that have been fulfilled. So he's still explaining what he had thought in the four gospels. The fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Remember we said Jesus spoke from the law and the prophets beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So we traced all that he taught them in the Old Testament. 
So it means that even up to this point, the details of his resurrection were not yet known. Because he wasn't talking about post-resurrection. What he was explaining to them was pre-resurrection. The things I said to you before I died. He still was explaining because they had not understood that to be able to understand this. They were still seeking to understand. So it means that even up to this point, they were not sure what he was teaching them exactly. So, what was Jesus exactly doing here in chapter 24 of Luke? From verse 25, 26, 27, 44, 45, 46. What was Jesus doing? He affirmed in Luke 24, he was affirming his teaching before resurrection. There was no revelation in what he was teaching them. Because those things were taught by the law and the prophets. And all of them had read it anyway. But the details of his death and resurrection. Which is a walk of the spirit of truth. The details of his death and resurrection. Which is a walk of the spirit of truth. Wasn't made known yet. It was not yet revealed to them. All he was still explaining to them. Was what the prophet said. What Moses said. But the revelation of his death, burial, and resurrection had not yet been revealed to them at this point. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. What did Jesus say he will do? He will go away and he will send the comforter to them. Now what did he say when the comforter is come? He will do. Give me the next verse. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. That word reprove in another translation is the word convict. The word convict confuses people because they think that the Holy Ghost will convict people. Meaning he will point them to their sins. He will make them aware of their sins. That's what people think generally. That the word convict means that the Holy Ghost will make people aware of their sin or bring people to the consciousness of their sin. But the word convict or reproof is the word reveal. The word reveal. He will reveal. That is the job of this revelation that is post-resurrection. When he is come, he will convict the world of sin. And what they think is that the Holy Ghost will point out the wrong of people or their sins. That will mean also that the Holy Ghost will convict or point out the wrong of sin, the wrong of righteousness, and the wrong of judgment, if that's what it means. Because if convict is to point out the wrong of sin, it will mean to point out the wrong of righteousness and to point out the wrong of judgment, which does not make sense. So what he's talking about convict there is to reveal. He will reveal. That is the job of this revelation. Post-resurrection. He will, he will reveal sin. He will reveal righteousness. He will reveal judgment. Where will he reveal sin, righteousness, and judgment? He will reveal sin, righteousness, and judgment in the resurrection. In the resurrection. That is where that revelation will come. That means he will unveil sin. He will unveil righteousness. He will unveil judgment. So he will unveil what is in the resurrection. Now how many of you know that the resurrection can also be called eternal life? Eternal life is the resurrection. And the resurrection can also be called life. The resurrection can also be called life. And if you understand that this is the gospel, if you understand, listen carefully, if you understand that the gospel is resurrection, the gospel is eternal life, and the gospel is life, you will not first of all see the gospel as a cure to sin. You will not first of all see the gospel as a cure to sin, even though it cures sin. But you will not first of all see the gospel as a cure to sin. Because when it was given to Adam, 
You'll be wondering why will God give Adam the gospel? Adam has not seen. Adam is innocent. He has just been created. Created, you know, uh, created by God, him and Eve. No sin he recorded against them. And God gave the gospel to them. So if it was to cure sin, they would not need the gospel. So the first target of the gospel is not to cure sin. That is not the essence of life. Even though it has a cure for sin. Look at John 16, 12 again. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot bear them now. Verse 13, have it. Pay attention now, because this is where you need to catch when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Next verse. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. He shall receive of mine. He will take the things that are mine and reveal or show it unto you. The work of the Holy Spirit will be to take that which is mine and show it unto you. Where? In the incarnation or in the resurrection? In the resurrection. Because before the resurrection, all that Christ was going to suffer and go through has been written in the law and the prophets. And because they read, they should have known. And because they didn't understand, Jesus spent Luke 24 teaching them and explaining these realities to them. How be it, the resurrection, the post-resurrection will be shown to them by the Holy Ghost. The post-resurrection details will be revealed to them by the Holy Ghost. He will take them and show it. He will show it to them. He will explain it. He will make it clear to them or he will make it visible to them. The Holy Ghost will do that job when he is come. So the question now will be, what is in the resurrection? What is in the resurrection? That's very important. What is in the resurrection? Obviously, whatever will be found in the resurrection will be found in Christ. Whatever will be found in the resurrection will be found in Christ. What is in the resurrection? So the resurrection is not a revelation of who is in hell. Mm -mm. It is what is found in Christ. The resurrection is a revelation of what is found in Christ. So that is why whatever happened on the way to Emmaus and thereafter cannot be the revelation of the resurrection. It cannot be the revelation of the resurrection. Because he says, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will show you, he will explain, he will make visible to you all things. When he is come. John chapter 14 verse 1 everybody. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Next verse. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Next verse. And if I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there you may be also. Let's trace it a bit. So one of the things he is going to show when he is come, he will take that which is mine and will reveal to you. So whatever he will reveal to us is what is in Christ. Are we in, on the same page? Whatever the Holy Spirit will reveal after resurrection will be what is in Christ. So what are the things that the Holy Ghost will show? Number one, he will show us many mansions, many places. And how I many of you know, let me stretch your minds a bit. 
You can translate that many places. You can translate it to mean the names a believer is called. Look at verse 3 of John chapter 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. The word there where is italicized. So, where I am there can be what I am. Where I am can be what I am, you will be. You will be what I am, you will be where I am. Where I am, you will be. What I am, you will be also. These are post-resurrection things. Post-resurrection. From the things they said after he spoke. It was very obvious that they needed another comforter. And the way people look at the word of God today, it is much more obvious that we need another, another comforter. Because look at what they said. 14 verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there you may be also. Next verse. And whither I go you know. And the way you know. You know where I'm going. You know the way. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Isn't it obvious that they need another comforter? Then Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Look at the next verse, verse 7. If you have known me, you shall have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him, and have seen him. Next verse, verse 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, we will be sufficient. Verse 9. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me, has seen the Father. And now sayest thou then, show us the Father. Verse 10. Believest thou not? That I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now look at verse 11, everybody. If you can read, read with me wherever you are. Believe me that I in my Father, and the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the very works sake. Can I have a powerful amen? So what was Jesus asking them to believe him? He was asking them to believe him. Now to believe him there was identification. Give me that verse 11 again. I'm going to read carefully. Then I will explain what I'm about to explain. Believe me that I in the father. I in the father. And the father in me. Identification. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. I in the Father, the Father in me. Identification. We are two persons will be seen as the same and they are still two persons. That's identification. For clarity of purpose, he now says in verse 16, you will see a strong proposition there in verse 16 of John 14. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17 now, listen carefully. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, that's key preposition. We are an in. We are an in. Now the preposition in is very key. The preposition in is very key. He is with and shall be in. So the comforter will reveal, will make visible what is in. Look at verse 18 of John chapter 14 now. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So, the things that are of Christ, he will take that which is mine and he will reveal to you. 
So what are the things that are of Christ that the Holy Spirit or the Comforter will reveal? Number one, he mentioned mansion. He will reveal to you mansion. Number two, he will reveal to you the way, the truth, and the life. Number three, he mentioned places. Places. Number four, he mentioned the Father is in me and I in the Father. The things that the spirit of truth will reveal to you. Then he mentioned walks. He mentioned his name. Then he mentioned the indwelling. Then he mentioned with an in. He mentioned with an in. Then he mentioned abide with you forever. Those are his things. The things that are mine, he will take the things that are mine and he will show it to you. When he is come, post-resurrection, he will take the things that are mine and he will show them to you. Mansion, way through to life, places, the father in me and I in the father, walks, his name, the indwelling with an in, he will abide with you forever. Then look at verse 19 now. In, in a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. Because I live. Very clear. Why? Because he said, Where I am, there you may be. What I am, that you will be. Because I live, you live. The language of identification. Now, listen carefully. He started by letting them see identification. The father is identified in me. I am identified in the father. He said, the very same way you will be identified. The same way I'm identified in my father and my father identified in me, you will be identified. I in my father, my father in me, you in me. I in you. The same way. Identification. So, when he said the spirit of truth, then now said, I will be in. The spirit of truth will be in. I'm with you and will be in you. Identification. Before we get to brother Paul, let's say to Jesus is teaching on identification. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Your mind should not go to another person. Your mind should stop thinking of another person. I am with you and I will be in you. Stop thinking of another person. Okay? Identification. Somebody say identification. All right. He says, because I live, you will live also. So in his resurrection, we must see ourselves. I mean, don't blame those guys on the way to Emmaus. There's no way they could have understood. In fact, you know what, Pastor Praise? The more Jesus was with them, the more confused they were. You know, it's like I am with you and we're talking and I said, I am in you. Two of us are walking. And I said, I am in you. It makes no sense. If Jesus was even away, it will make some sense. But he's with them. So you can't blame them. Because it doesn't really make sense. How can we be together? You are saying you are in me. All right. So imagine what these guys were going through in their minds. Now look at John 14, 20. At that day, at that day, which day? In the context of the teaching. Huh? Yeah, resurrection. But in that context, he didn't talk about resurrection. In the context of this teaching where we're reading now, which is the day? Let me read then. I will ask you again so that you follow the thought pattern from 16. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Next verse, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you 
and shall be in you. 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 19. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But you see me because I live. You shall live also. 20. At that day you shall know. Which day? When he the spirit of truth comes into you. When he, when he comes into you, you shall know. It's his work not to reveal to you, to take off mine and show to you now. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father, and ye in me, and I in you. So, what will be the result of the indwelling of the spirit? Anybody? Huh? Huh? In this context. Because I live. You live also. That will be the effect of the indwelling of the spirit. That when it comes into you, you will come alive. Because I live, you will live the way I live. Identification. That will be the outcome of the indwelling of the spirit. That will be the result. You will live because I live. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So those are the things of Christ to be shown to you. Look at it. Verse 20 of John 14. At that day you shall know. What will you know? That I in my father and you in me and I in you. You shall know. Why will you know? Because the spirit of truth dwelling in you will take the things that are in me and will show to you. Is it getting clear? Yeah. He will take the things that are in me and he will show to you. He is not saying he will show you your future or your career or your future life partner. No, 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 no. Please don't reduce what he's saying to all these material things. He's talking about spiritual realities that were contained in his post-resurrection that required the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So when he said he will show you things to come, you and I are in the things to come. You and I, our resurrection is part of the things to come. Because I live, you shall live also. So look at John 16, 7 again. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So we can say that the primary work of the spirit of truth. The primary work of the spirit of truth from this discussion. Is to reveal our relationship with Christ. The primary work of the spirit of truth from this discussion is to reveal our relationship with Christ. That is his primary work. That is the primary work of the spirit of truth to reveal our relationship with Christ. In John 16, 7, there's a word there I want to look at quickly. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, the word expedient. The word expedient is the word sumfero. It's a key word. It's used for advantage. Expedient for you. Expedient for you. That I go away. Hey. Expedient for you. Not for me. It is expedient for you. Or of more advantage for you that I go away. Who is the beneficiary? You. Who is he going away for? You. Okay. Now. It is expedient, advantageous. You will see the word advantage or the word expedient in John eleven fifty. Now consider that it is expedient for us. That one man should die for the people. And that the whole nation should perish not. 1150 expedient that same word sumfero look at it in john 18 14 kephas was he which gave counsel to the jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people 
expedience soon Pharaoh. Acts 20, 20. The word expedient. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. That same word. Soon Pharaoh. The word expedient. You know, profitable. Expedient. Advantageous. The word expedient can also be seen in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Expedient. 1 Corinthians 7, 15. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 33. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. The manifestations of the Spirit are given to every man to profit with all advantage or benefit. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. Hebrews 12, 10. Where it says, correction for your benefit. Correction for your benefit. Advantage. For your benefit or advantage. So Jesus said, it is expedient or beneficial for you that I go away. When he said I go away, was it departure or arrival? Arrival. Okay, who is going to benefit from the going away? You. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to who? To you. So the going away will benefit you how? By him coming to you. You are the beneficiary. Because with you will not benefit you like in you. So for you to benefit, I've got to go in coming in. Mm. Eh. So the going away is for you to benefit. So the going away is a figure of speech. It is needful for you that I go away. It's not go away from the earth. He was still in the earth. Because he was going to be in you. So when he showed up. He showed up in Luke 24, 25. Question. Please, I need your answer. When Jesus showed up in Luke 24, 25. Was he in them? Eh? In Luke 24, 25. Was he in them? Eh? Okay, let me help you soon. Wait to let me help you soon. Wait, let me help you soon. Did you understand what I'm asking? When Jesus showed up after resurrection in Luke 24 25, was he in them? Eh? Okay, yes, no. Okay, keep it. When Stephen saw Jesus in a vision standing by the right hand of God, was Jesus in Stephen? Eh? When Paul saw Jesus in the church, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you persecute. Was Jesus in the church? Eh? He was in the church. Okay. When Stephen saw him by the right hand of God, was he in the church? So when Jesus rose from the dead on the way to Emmaus, and he called them fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was he in them? Huh? Okay, keep it somewhere in your notebook. Eventually, you are the one answering today. My own answer is coming. Amen. I said amen. As I closed Acts chapter 26 verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. To open their eyes is the word anogio in the Greek. To open similar to Luke 24, 45. When they said he opened their understanding. That is what they had never seen before. They saw. So when Paul says to open their eyes. It will mean that what people have never seen before. My gospel is to open their eyes to the details of the resurrection. The details of the resurrection. So the preaching of the gospel is not showing a man he's seen. When you preach the gospel, you are to open their eyes to God. When we are talking to someone on the road, in the bus, in the car, in the house, our mission is to open their eyes to God. I have news for you. We have the gospel. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which opens a man's eyes to God. Not to sin. 
Your eyes are not open to condemnation. Your eyes are not open to judgment. Your eyes are open to the arms of your loving father. And because God is love, you are attracted to draw closer. You are attracted to find out. You are attracted to know him. And you are not afraid to talk to him. You are not afraid to, to go close. Because he's not looking for how to get you. He's not looking for how to carry out punishment on you. Rather, he has punished himself for you. He's looking for how to get his goodness to you. Can somebody shout, I hear you. That's the God we preach. That's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the God brother Paul was talking about in Acts chapter 26 verse 18. Look at it again. You will love it. Open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Not from darkness to punishment. From darkness to light. I love brother Paul. Look at the way he constructed that verse. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive that word to turn. Notice. The word to turn is the word epistrefo in the Greek. To turn. Epistrefo, E-P-I-S-T-R-E-P-H-O. Acts 3.19. Repent it therefore and be converted. That word converted is to turn. Epistrefo. Acts 9.35. And all that dwelt at Lida and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. It's a faith turn. At what point do you make the turn when your eyes are opened? At what point do you make the turn when your eyes are open? So when you are an unbeliever, you are actually going to hell. When you see the love of God, you make a turn. You make a turn. Acts 11.21 a peace threefold. The hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. A great number believed and turned unto the Lord. A peace threefold. Acts 14, 15 and saying says, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn. From these vanities unto the living God. Which made heaven and earth. And the sea and all things that are therein. Turn. Acts 15, 19. Wherefore my sentence is. That we trouble not them. Which from among the Gentiles. Are turned to God. They are turned. So that turn. Is a turn of faith. So Acts 26, 18 again. To turn them. From a peace to turn them from darkness, then they turned to God from darkness to light to God via information, not behavior. The turn is not a turn of behavior, it's a turn via information. It's a turn via information. So it's a knowledge issue to turn from darkness to light. From obscurity to light. From the power of Satan unto God. Who are we preaching? So we preach him and the word that we get from him is his resurrection. Am I communicating at all? You will turn from darkness to light. Colossians 1.13 Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness to turn them from darkness to light from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Where is God? Power city, where is God? In man. Where is man? Huh? Where is man? Where is God? Where is God? Where is man? Exactly. God is in man. Man is in God. Identity. So you are turning to a man. And by turning to a man, you are turning to God. Colossians 1.14 In whom... 
we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The word aphesis, aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S, aphesis. Luke 24, 47. That is what we get out of his resurrection. Aphesis. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We preach repentance. Write it down. We preach repentance. What is repentance? The forgiveness of sins. Acts 26, 18 again. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance. That forgiveness of sins, that is inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ. That is in, in Christ, in Christ. That they may receive. It means it's not imposed. People willingly receive. It's not imposed. People willingly receive. It's to Lombano. Lombano what? Aphesis. What is aphesis? Forgiveness of sins. What does he call forgiveness of sins? An inheritance. An inheritance. You're talking to an unsaved man. And you tell him you have an inheritance. An unbeliever. You come to preach to him. The first thing you tell him is, gentleman, something you're not aware of. You have an inheritance. That's good news. You have what? An inheritance. The word kleros in the Greek. Kleros. It means your lot or what belongs to you or what has your name on it. An inheritance. So he's saying there is an inheritance. So when we turn that man's attention to God, he sees life in God. When we turn that man's attention by knowledge to God, he sees life. He sees life in God. So you can see that the word inheritance is so vital in the Pauline revelation. Because a man can only have a part amongst men. A man can only have a part amongst men. You have seen your part in God, but your part in God is in a man. You have seen your part in man and your part in man is in God. Your part in man is in God. So that's how it can be logic. Logos. Logic. The logic is that God has become a man. That's the logos from the beginning. In the beginning was the logos, the logic. That God will become a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. That God is manifest. So the logic of scripture is that we see God in a man. And we see man in God. Identification is the logic. Because we have that inheritance among them that are sanctified. The word agezo in the Greek, set apart. Among them that are set apart. How are you set apart? Those that faith has set apart. By the faith that is in me. So the setting apart is a function of the faith in the gospel. So what sets a man apart is not the inheritance. The inheritance is for all men. But what sets a man apart is faith. What sets a man apart is faith. So the inheritance is in the sanctified by faith in me. That's why I said that it is able to give you an inheritance among those sanctified. In Acts 20, 32. Which is able to give you 
Now that word which is able to give is as though it will. But it's actually, it is used in the past tense. Which has given you an inheritance. It's not what God will do. It's what God has done. So the word of his grace opens your eye to what you have received in Christ. So it's not what will be done. Is which has given you an inheritance among those sanctified. That's the way that scripture is read in the original. I commend it to God and to the word of his grace which has given you an inheritance. Which has given you an inheritance among those sanctified. Our lot is in a man. Our man is in God. <laughs> Our lot is in a man. Our man is in God. Our lot is in God. And God is in man. <laughs> We're dealing with logic, right? Okay. Our Lord is in a man. And our man is in God. Our Lord is in God. And God is in man. Look at what Paul now said. My job is simple. To make you see it. To shed light. Where? From the scriptures. To throw light on the scriptures. So you can see. That your lot is in God. Our God is in man. Or our lot is in man. And our man is in God. A man like God. <laughs> a man like God. You will see that you have a lot in Christ. What he's saying to you is that whatever belongs to you in Christ belongs to the man that is in hell right now. But it has to be received. The man is in hell because he has not received it. At the point of receiving it, it, you are turned from darkness to light. You are turned from the power of Satan to serving the living God. Acts 18.22 When he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phagia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Strengthening. Strengthening. He was witnessing. Where did Paul start his epistle from? He started where Jesus stopped. That's where I've been heading to since we started this teaching. Where did brother Paul's epistle begin from? It began from where Jesus stopped. So Jesus left the key issues. And Paul started from the key issues. So Paul is obviously Christ preaching. So the sermons of Paul. Is Paul taking Jesus sermon notes. And teaching them. Paul took Jesus' sermon notes and taught them. A theologian said, the teachings of brother Paul are the advanced teachings of Jesus. The Pauline epistle are the advanced teachings of Jesus. A theologian said that and I agree with him. Because what brother Paul did was to take Jesus' teaching notes and taught from there. Praise God. I said, praise God. I said, praise God. I said, praise God. Christ is the life of the scriptures. He is the life of the scriptures. He is the gift of the scriptures. He is the promise of the scriptures. He is the man in God and he is the God in man. If you receive anything in the scriptures for Christ then the scriptures are not fulfilled. If you receive anything in the scriptures for Christ, then the scriptures are not fulfilled. Christ fulfilled everything. There is nothing to receive for him. Everything you receive today is for you. Kabada gaba. Kabada gaba. Christ did not give us something. He gave us himself. He gave us himself. So the spirit is in us. The spirit is Christ. 
The spirit is Christ. I didn't say there is no trinity. We will get there. We will get there from what we are teaching now. But I don't know when we will get there. Maybe next year or three years from now. But as we are traveling, we will get there. There is no need to jump syllables. We follow. The spirit is Christ. So, the spirit is in us. And brother Paul was very clear. He said, the spirit is life. So, what is eternal life? Eternal life is the spirit within. And eternal life is a man. So, the spirit will reveal the father. Eternal life is a man. John 17, 1 to 3. Eternal life is a man. This word spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Next verse. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. Glory to God. That they might know thee the only through God. That they might know thee the only through God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So Jesus is eternal life. And he dwells in us forever. Jesus is the spirit of life. And is a man. And he dwells in us. Not for some months. He dwells in us forever. If he gave us anything other than himself. He didn't give us something. But I have news for you. He gave us himself. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Jesus gave us his spirit. And Paul taught that as in Christ. What did he call it? In Christ. We are identified in his spirit. And his spirit is identified in us. That's why brother Paul never taught imitation. Rather, he taught identification. When he rose, we rose with him. Where he is, we are. As he is, so are we in this world. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. Lift your right hand and say with me, I am in him, justified. He is in me, glorified. Stand on your feet, let me pray for you. Hallelujah. Oh, la bodege Father, I pray for everybody in this building, everybody online, everybody in our campuses, everybody around the world watching by one platform or the other. I decree that revelation knowledge continues to grow big in our hearts until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, you said that when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will take that which is yours in the resurrection and he will show it to us. And right here, the spirit of God through the teaching of God's word is showing us all that is contained in the resurrection. So I decree that the eyes of your people continually be enlightened in the name of Jesus. Veils fall off. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Your people equipped, built up, edified, Jesus glorified. We take authority over infirmity, over sickness and disease. In the name of Jesus, we bind and cast you out. Now, body be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Infirmity, go in the name of Jesus. Matoba, Kalede, Rakoto, Bira, Nanane, Nebajokolo, the Bobo, Sebila, Nama, Satan, get your hands off in the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed. Receive it in the name of Jesus. By your talea, by your talea, by your talea, by your talea, by your talea. Thank you, Father. And those who need miracles in this service right now, we agree with you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we command miracles manifested. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Where you need an intervention, receive one right now. In the name of Jesus, you receive it right now. Meto balata. Meto balata. Meto balata. Meto balata. Reto balegege. Majoko lodobaya. Meta radabekete. Meto ladabaya naha. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. 
we give you praise. We arrange circumstances and situations and we shift things around and we declare your people favored in the name of Jesus. Thank you for answer prayer and thank you for the blessing in Jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality welcome back ladies and gentlemen welcome back oh my goodness what a service I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace please don't go away don't go away the essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up equip you so you can do the work of ministry that's the whole essence not just to acquire knowledge and see that but to teach you so you can teach others brother Paul says the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail. Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall work with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them, or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen.